Okay. Kudos to Glenn Farrell. This is the guy. This is a write-up he did for. Uh, I mean, for service reports a while back, from back service reports, and I really like uh, a lot of the stuff that he says because I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you know. What you don't want to do is get out there and just flailing around and getting blindsided by situations that are going to clean your plow when you're working on anything. And air conditioner is one of those things that can do that. But before we start, we've got a blurb here. Read this and see what you think about what was said here. This is from a guy that watches my YouTube videos. I want everybody to read very careful what he says and put our cell phones away. All right. Star. Once again, I truly value the videos you upload. I've been a technician for nine years. I learned a lot from each of your lessons. However, I cringe when I see the lack of respect some of your students have for you. He's hearing you guys, okay? Uh, no, we're just doing they should be lucky to have somebody as educated as you teaching them. <laughs> I wish I had you as a teacher. Thank you again. And then this other guy who read this post said, I have to agree with this 100%. I would have worked three jobs to pay to go to school with a teacher like you. I truly enjoy the videos myself and look forward to each new one before you post. I have other people that say, nobody that I have heard of at any technical college goes to the trouble to teach as much as you do. I don't hear you call it sick right now. Yeah, they, yeah, do see, they, they don't know what happens behind that camera when it's not rolling. <laughs> yeah. All right, a thing about air conditioning, they always find the money to get the AC repaired no matter what the cost because they want to be cool. They often have no problem spending a thousand dollars for an air conditioner repair on a vehicle worth eight hundred dollars. So the bottom line is air conditioning work, one of the most profitable services their shops offer, and most customers expect to dig deep when their AC system acts up. Now they don't have to every time. Um, for example, this one girl had a little Volkswagen Beetle. And she had almost no money. And what happened was, she said, I got no air conditioning. She had a little fan on the dash. It was really about 100 degrees that summer. It was really, 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 really hot. And so I said, what we can do, went to charge it up. And there was a, a liquid line, had a strap around it, you know, that they put a little strap they bolted on there. And it had had enough uh, movement there to where it had broke that little liquid line and it was leaking all the refrigerant out. And so it just so happened that I took a uh, 3 8 uh, copper tubing union, which is perfectly safe on an air conditioning system. And I put that line back together with a 3 h copper tubing union, and she was back in business for no money. Well, she had taken it somewhere, and they wanted $400 to put an evaporator in, I mean, a condenser in it. Anyway, using low-quality parts, though, is the worst way to a happy customer. Because if you put crappy parts on there, and you can buy, there's a lot of cheap, crummy parts out there. You know what I mean? If you're going to put parts on there, you need to put good ones on there. Uh, and the best way to customer not only may not return, but also won't speak highly of you. Like if the part fails, they're going to blame it on you. Well, you don't scrimp on quality, use better parts. They cost more for a reason. Here, this is what I've learned over the past 40 years. Do it right the first time. That means put everything back like it's supposed to be. Don't be sloppy with your work and all that. You know, don't, don't get into the notion of uh, figuring out, I just want to get this one out of my stall and move on to the next job or whatever. Don't oversell, replace only what's needed. In other words, I used to know this one guy that every time he even pulled one in there, he wanted to throw a compressor at it whether it needed it or not. Kind of like a belt and suspenders thing, but he wasn't paying for it. Don't try to get rich on one job. <laughs> Got it? Treat the customer like you want your mother treated. Stand behind your work. Don't play with your cell phone in class. And don't tackle a job you're not completely comfortable doing. There's nothing wrong with telling a customer you don't service that brand of system. If it's a job you don't think you can handle, you know, if you know you're going to run into trouble, say, look, you need to take this one somewhere else. Don't be, a, don't be ashamed of that. So none of us knows what the future of automotive air conditioning will be, but you can bet it will be a part of our transportation for a long time because people are not going to ride around hot. So not going to do it. Comes in with a hybrid, just tell them not working <laughs> yeah, if you're not, I mean, that's right. I mean, if somebody's got a, if somebody comes in with a hybrid and you're not comfortable with servicing it, say, look, you know, you need to take that to a shop that does hybrids because I don't do hybrids, you know, whatever. Uh, of course, we do hybrids here, so you may get to work on them some. You know. All right. So take it for a test run. Observe the speedometer, odometer, wipers, washers, radio, tape player, CD player, clock, navigation. Look at everything. Make sure that everything that you see on that car, make a note of what works and what doesn't before you ever crack into the job. Right. Uh, be on the lookout for air, strange noises. Uh, make the, let the vehicle owner go on the drive with you if possible so anything you find can be pointed out and documented. Okay, in other words, this is something you want to always be on the same sheet of music with the customer with so that they're not going to be. And I will tell you, customers are lazy enough 
to where they just want to come throw you their keys and say, my air conditioner don't work, fix it, without telling you what's going on. And sometimes you wind up getting led astray like that. Well, back at the shop, you got to look at the dash illumination lamp, hazard warning lamps, turn signal indicators, all that stuff. Check all of the dash mounted switches, make for proper operation as well. If any of them don't work, make a note of it. Don't forget to check engine light. A you know, quick code, code scan wouldn't hurt. Now, that sounded like you're going to a lot of trouble. But look at the condition of the dash. Look for hairline cracks. If you're working on an old car, how many of you guys have taken an old part off and seen a crack up here where there wasn't one before because the part was old and brittle? You know what I'm saying? It happens, doesn't it? Okay. Once you start pushing or pulling, those hairline cracks are going to grow, and that once beautiful one-piece dash may become a five- or six-piece dash. We did it in my mom's car. Yeah, and that's something. When you're pulling it apart, you're not going to bust it all to pieces. A few digital pictures can settle a lot of arguments. Take the pictures before you ever start the work. Click, 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 click. This is before I started the work, right? Okay, right. make sure all the fan speeds work. All the ducts operate like they should, including the temperature control blend door, warm, cold. Look under the hood, make sure the heater core has both hoses hooked up. Hook tip, ha ha, very funny. And all AC lines, hoses, and accumulator are connected and everything looks like it left the factory, except it may have a little road ground on it, okay? Now, once inside the dash, if you come across anything that doesn't look right, like splashed wires, glued plastic parts, bailing wire, blend door, board door, you know, anything they've done, if they've patched something, take pictures, make a note on the invoice so the next time somebody goes into the dash, they won't blame you for substandard work and have the customer come back and say, hey, they found this thing tied together with bailing wire in here. And you say, that was not like that before. Now, let, if it's got something to do with what you're working on, you need to fix it back the right way, though. But, you know, unless they want you to go and fix everything you find in there, and that can be pretty pricey. You know, some stuff you may want to leave like it is, because on some old cars, well, like for example, uh, my aunt drives a 92 Crown Victoria, and there are some trim parts and stuff you absolutely will not get from the inside of that car. They don't even have them salvage yards anymore. So, uh, so these few steps up front may take a few extra minutes, but they may save you a lot of hours and big bucks at the end, and maybe a sleepless night or two. So, we all get calls where the AC gets cold, then quits cooling anywhere from a few minutes to a day or more. Now, sometimes when they bring it in, it may cool just fine. Now, were you here? Uh, you remember the girl that was in dual enrollment? Uh, Jessica. Jessica on her Dodge pickup. Yes, I was helping her with that. All right, so what happens was when we put the thermometer in the dash, we put it on, and we talk in a minute on the PowerPoint thing about low blow, max AC, Windows up, thermometer in place. What did we see on her? Do you remember? It was getting colder than it should have. It got too cold. It kept getting colder and colder and colder. And then her airflow went away. So what was happening? Freezing. The evaporator was freezing up. What did we find wrong? you remember? Uh, I think it wasn't on the compressor. It was one of those parts. I can't remember what it's called. Low though. pressure cycling switch. Yeah. That thing on the accumulator wasn't open enough to turn the compressor on. Well, you see this guy holding on to the low pressure cycling switch. And you'll see this picture again in a minute. You can hold on to that thing and you can feel it when it opens and closes. Uh, but anyway, this guy, Glenn, says he usually finds a problem with one of these four things. And I agree, the clutch relay, pressure sensor, clutch coil, or the blend door. It'll be one of those things. All right, typically, sometimes it may take an hour or more for the problem to show up. You hook up the gauges, start the engine, set the control head to full cold, Lower speed to the lowest setting, press the max recirculation button, set the RPM to 1500. Engine RPM needs to be up. Also, you need to have a blower, I mean a fan, blowing across the condenser to make sure that the head pressure doesn't go up too high. I'll mention that again in a minute. All right, it may take an hour or more for the problem to show up. Put an electronic thermometer, I mean, I, that's the same heading I had on the last one. Put an electronic thermometer probe in the center vent, or you can just put one of those little stem ones like we've got. Wait and watch. Uh, try to make the compressor cycle on and off as much as you possibly can. Because when you got it on low blow, max AC, and your re, re air conditioning there on the inside, you're going to see it, you know, clicking off and on, off and on, off and on. All right. So you can feel the pressure switch and the relay click on most vehicles as they turn on and off. You put your hand on the, I mean, your finger on the relay and one hand on the switch if you can reach them both and you'll feel them clicking. Now, if there's a click that happens and something doesn't change that that switch is supposed to be handling, that's whenever you know you got some kind of an issue. Now, you know why the low pressure cycling switch is there? If the pressure goes below a certain uh, pressure slash temperature, which temperature and pressure basically run pretty close together, 
uh, then it's basically going to open up the clutch. The reason that on this dodge out here that the compressor wouldn't kick on is because there was no pressure in the system at all other than atmospheric pressure. And so the switch basically would never let the compressor come on. Uh, after the engine's reached full operating temperature, move the temperature control full hot and back to full cold a good many times to test blend door operation. Make sure that it, do, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you can be absolutely sure that it's operating without a hitch. Now on Gene's truck, there was a, uh, whenever he would turn his, and we basically got the blend door. You can't do this with every blend door actuator, so be really careful with this on the Ford, you can. Uh, you know, you got to make sure that you understand what you're doing here. Uh, like on some of them, if you have the thing just plugged in and you're turning the knob, it'll get out of sync. <laughs> and that's a problem. You know what I'm saying? But on that Ford, it wouldn't. So we basically, whenever on that module, what do you mean you work for uh, the, the, act, the blend door actuator would be the, uh, let me grab one. I think I got one laying right here. See this thing right here? This blend door actuator? This one came off of Gene's truck. So when we had the wires plugged in, and you know we got it out of the dash, and we had it plugged in, and we turned the knob, it would start to go, it was moving the blend door, and it would start to move the blend door, and then it would go back, and he always had hot air, he didn't have any air. And so this was a problem on his. Now these right here die fairly regularly. You're going to see these. On your GM vehicles, one or the other of them may not be a blend door every time, but some of these other actuators, a little teeth will break off of them in there. They go click, 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 click. Sometimes people will say, when I crank up my car, I listen, have to listen to this click, click, click sound in the dash. And it may not even be a symptom other than that noise, especially if it's the research door motor. And on the right hand side over there, that's what it usually is on an Impala. But we've seen those a lot of times. Now on these Chevrolets, what you got to do is you basically got to clear the everything up. When you put your new one on here, you don't plug it in on a Chevrolet on these newer Chevrolets and turn it back and forth to see it'll move. We did that on Gene's because I knew it wouldn't hurt anything, but his had a bad potentiometer in here and it didn't know where it was. See, so it actually wasn't working. I put another one in there and now he's just fine. So that's what we're talking about there. We want to make sure this thing works. Right? Uh, but anyway, on Chevrolet, what you're, the, the newer model Chevrolets, what you do is you got to put that, put that thing in there and then you got to, there's a fuse you pull and you got to clear all the memory from the whole system. And then when you crank it up, it's going to think it's brand new and it's going to find the cold and the hot, or it's going to find all the ranges of door movement and it's going to remember them. See what I'm saying? So you basically got to initialize it that way. And that's not unusual to have to do that for, for stuff. You got to initialize a lot of these actuators and stuff. Uh, as soon as the vent temperature starts to rise while on the full cold setting, we want to look and see if the compressor is running. See, in other words, if you've got it on all this and your vent temperature starts to go up, you know, from maybe 35 to 40, 45, 50 or whatever. Usually when a, a healthy, uh, one on a cold day, if it's a really good system, we'll pull it down to between 40 and 50. Uh, but the hotter it is outside, the less it's going to pull it down. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you're not happy with how your air conditioner is doing, even if it's working right, if it's on a really, really, really hot day? But it'll work really, really good at night when it's cold, kind of cool. It feels like it's just freezing you out of there. Uh, that'll lead you to testing the blend door and even the water control valve, if it's got one not value valve. And of course, over serving, uh, you know, looking at the gauges. The, the compressor isn't engaged. You either tap or jump out the pressure switch, and then tap or jump out the relay. So you can basically find an electrical component that way. Don't do this unless the relays are exactly the same part numbers, and the problem goes away. You got lucky. So if you tap this, it kicks in. The relay turns out to be the problem. You put a relay in it. You send them on their way. You're good to go. Don't know how many times I've seen stuff like that on just all other kind of problems. I went by one day to look at an engine control problem where the well, basically, Joey's son had this uh, 2001 Ford pickup truck, and when he turned it on, the theft light was flashing, and they just knew there was something wrong with the anti-theft system and all that, so I went by there, and I turned it on, and I noticed, you know, of course, you don't get any starter operation on that one, and uh, whenever I went out there and looked in the engine compartment, I got my test light, and I uh, checked the power at the injectors, and it was real dim. It's supposed to be a nice bright battery voltage, and I tapped on the eight power relay, and it woke up. Light quit flashing, truck started up. He just needed a relay. Real simple fix on that one. Then you have to pull a you know code. All right. Uh, don't do that. Don't swap relays unless they're the same part number. If the problem goes away, you know you did good. If no clutch engagement is there, you got to use extreme caution. But you tap the front of the clutch hub with a three-foot screwdriver for hard to get the compressor. The shorter one when the compressor is sitting nicely on top. So if you've got if the compressor is turning this way, make sure you tap it in the same direction it's going to turn. If you tap it in the other direction, it's liable to throw the screwdriver back in your face. 
You know what I mean? If it catches and throws it back over there, and you don't want that. You know? uh, the clutch engages during either one of those taps, tests you found the call. That's going to be, has worked over 100 problems without a callback. That's what he's talking about in his uh, business. He's got a mobile air conditioning business where he goes here, there, and other fixes people's air conditioners at their house. Um, but I will say, if you tap the clutch and it clicks in, you're, you're talking about air gap. You got to make sense your air gap because over time, a lot of them will wear out like that. One time there was a, an instructor over here that says, Can you, what are you doing with my air conditioner? We tapped it and it, it pulled in. And I said, shut it off, we'll put the air gap. And so I called a student over there who was not particularly very motivated. And the student watched me while I took, I told the student, do this, do this. And he was just standing there looking up in the air with his mouth open like you know he usually did. And I pulled the uh, compressor clutch off of there and I pulled a couple of shims out and I put it back on and I measured it. It had a little less than 20 thousandths of a uh, gap, which was beautiful. And so whenever I did that, um, the air conditioner worked, and the instructor was so happy that they gave the student $20. <laughs> I didn't want any money, but he gave the guy a tip for watching me fix the car, which was whatever, you know. Uh, the clutch was engaged, the evaporator in and out, they were warm, the high side was low, and the low side was in a vacuum. Uh, this was one that he was talking about that he saw previously. So he got low side stuck in a vacuum, you know, everything's low. A new expansion valve and dryer cured that one. And every time you turn around, uh, whenever you have a dryer, it comes apart on the inside and the little beads get in there and they stop something up or if your expansion valve is clogged up, you'll have both sides read low even though you got a full charge. So be aware of that. So a lot of them have dual zone or his and her systems and they are even uh, a lot of basic manual systems have got duct work that allow half the vents to be cooled by the top half of the evaporator coil and the other half to be cooled by the lower half. And so, if you run into a situation here, you got blend door on both sides, see, so trying to track a problem down. So, a lot of the time, uh, and you'll see this on a foreign car, on Asian makes, you may have on one side of the car, even if it's not a his and hers, even if it's just a one side, you may find it blowing colder on one side of the car than on the other side of the car. It may be blowing warm over here and cold over there. Always check and make sure it's not low on the refrigerator. Because if it's low on refrigerant sometimes, every ounce counts because a lot of them are just got like a pound of refrigerant in them down there. And so be careful about that. Um, so electronic thermometer is one of the things you need. You got or a very, two very accurate mechanical thermometers if you stick them each side of the dash. Add refrigerant at an ounce at a time watching the gauge pressures and the temperatures starting to equalize. So if both of them come together as you add the refrigerant a little at a time, you know that you were just a little bit low on refrigerant. But a low system usually indicates a leak, not always. Using less refrigerant, on, they, they used to use three or four pounds on all these cars. And now they use like, ever since about 2000, a lot of them are down to like a pound, 1.25, just under a pound. Uh, system charged on the lower end of its spec range may work well in 80 degree air with 20% humidity. I've seen that. I have seen somebody bring our car to me in the evening, so their air conditioner is burning them up during the day, but I turn on the air conditioner at night, you know, when I used to do work at old cars at home, I hadn't done that for 25 years, but anyway, I'd be sitting here and I'd turn on the air conditioner, it'd be freezing cold in there. And I'd say, what the heck is this all about, you know? And I'd keep fooling with it until I finally came up with the fact that it was a pound low on the refrigerator, you know? Because uh, it'll cool good at night, but not in the daytime, if it's a little bit low. Cabin air filters are something that were few and far between 10 years ago. They're becoming quite common on high and low end vehicles, but not every vehicle has one. My wife's 2006 Explorer does not have a cabin air filter, but my 2007 Taurus does. On these, uh, this is the weirdest thing, on these Nissan uh, Altimas, the newer ones, the cabin air filter is right in the middle, up here in the front, and there's a little hole about this big that the cabin air filter comes out of. And you gotta reach up in there and get a hold of it with something. And when you pull it out, it accordions down to a small size to come out that hole. And when you pull it out, it springs back out to where it's like this big. So you're putting an air, a cabin air filter this big through a little hole. <laughs> and the people at the parts store are confused by this. And if you sell one, they will sell you one little filter that will look at one there. And I think what they intend for you to do is put one in, let it fall, and put another one in. And hold it up out of the way and then put a third one in or something. But if you take the Nissan filter, you just squish it down and you squeeze it through there. And when it gets in there, it pops back out in shape. And that's like late model Nissan Altima. We run into that here. Well, how would you get the three out if you did it that way? I don't know. But I mean, I don't ever put that many in there like that. Now on them GM cars, 
like a you know 2000 and up uh, vans and stuff like the GM van the minivans uh, you open the glove box and the little things right there and you pull one out and then you reach over slide the other one over and pull it out so they're, but they come out in pieces like that and you'll be surprised how much your airflow will be in fact impacted by that on when it's got a clogged up you'll find some you know squirrel nests in there you'll find acorns in there you'll find all kinds of dust and leaves and all kind of junk it's a good idea to replace cabin air filter and all that and there's actually a worksheet on that fellas um, the, the mercury sable had one out uh, if you're down in a dusty area you probably won't have a lot of that but if you drive a lot on a farm or something you're probably going to have issues with that a lot of customers don't even know they exist but that's a little discussed issue right there Besides low airflow output the vents, the clogged cabinet, cabinet air filter is called liquid refrigerant to enter the compressor. We don't want that. If we have an evaporator that's not evaporating totally because it's got bad airflow, you can actually wind up with liquid refrigerant getting in there and you can't squeeze liquid so the compressor causes problems. Uh, they asked Mike Ford's got a compressor anti-slugging strategy when you're first starting it. If the compressor is mounted low, they don't want the oil settling down in there. And so basically while you're spinning the car over, the PCM energizes the AC's compressor and starts it moving to move any oil out of there. They call it CASS, compressor anti-slugging strategy. Uh, you probably won't hear that anywhere else. Um, all right, so because of the low air movement across the evaporator, you might get that. So most cabin air filters are easy to get to, but some involve a good bit of dismantling somewhere inside the passenger compartment while others may be outside on the air intake. On that mercury sable, you take the, uh, this grill off in front of the windshield and you'll see it back up in there. So always make sure that you look in your book. You can't always assume it's got one. Sometimes there's one, well, not one. Now I'll tell you what's fundamental is funny. On some of the Lexus vehicles, they put horseradish in the, in the uh, air filter to kill bacteria. So that it you know won't be as much as but they do put horse radish. And some of them have got a dead gum ultraviolet light in there that burns up the destroys the germs, you know. Well you don't ever smell it. It's just like charcoal, you know what I'm saying? Alright, so one of the most important air conditioning components and overlooked has to be the thermostatic fan clutch. We talked about this before. This uh, bimetal spring actually changes the valving inside that thing to give it more. <laughs> it's kind of funny. They work just the opposite of how they should sometimes. Uh, on a cold morning startup, they may suck enough air to pull small animals in there. You know what I mean? And uh, in traffic, at the hottest part of the day, they may decide to start freewheeling uh, while driving the compressor head pressure may, you know, go through the ceiling. I mean, if the fan is not pulling any air across there and it needs to be pulling air across there because that fan clutch has gone bad on the inside, you may have head pressure going really high and it can blow the pop off that on the compressor. And this hogwash that Jonathan Price is always talking about, about uh, somebody put too much refrigerant in his vehicle and blew a hose, that's nonsense. The hose was weak to begin with. It can handle whatever pressure is in there. Going back to basics, they don't provide cold air. They just remove heat. That heat's got to be dissipated by the condenser, and at 60 miles an hour, you don't need a fan. My Taurus that I, that I drive, uh, or the, well, I know the other one. I had to look this one up. When you hit about 45 miles an hour, the fan goes totally offline, even if the AC's on. Because it, it knows it doesn't need it. It knows you're going 45 miles an hour. It knows there's air across the condenser. And it, does, it knows that it doesn't need to turn on the fan. So it goes, it takes the fan out of service. A lot of people don't know that because you're not watching for it, right? Okay. An anemometer is a device for measuring wind speed. Costs about $100. I do not have one, but I need to get one. Uh, they're very commonly used tools in a commercial refrigeration industry. You want to know how much airflow is here, how much airflow is here. If you're measuring it on both sides, if you're measuring it out in the front, you can basically tell how much airflow you got from the heat exchanger. And they're, they're, you can look at airspeed measurements from the left center and right dash vents. That's what it is. Okay, so tell me something that you learned. There's it's filters. Fast enough to suck small animal in. <laughs> yeah, you remembered the funny thing. What? There's filters and Cabin air filters, yeah. Yeah, I bet that, I don't know that for a fact, but I bet if you look up your mom's car, it's probably got one. They use horseradish. Yeah, they use horseradish in Lexus. Uh, although Lexus is due, and I think it's Lexus anyway, and they also got an ultraviolet light, and some of them it kills germs. What do you got? Everybody's told me they something they learned, but you were, were you dozing or what? I'll Okay. He already knew all that stuff. That's what it was. All right. All right. Now, I will tell you this. That uh, 